This is John Fetterman, the 34th Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania and a candidate for the United States Senate. On May 15th, just days before the Democrat primary, Fetterman revealed that he had suffered a stroke. Hey everybody, it's John and Giselle. As you can see, we hit a little bump on the campaign trail. Um, yeah. It was on Friday. Uh, I just wasn't feeling very well, so I decided, you know what, I need to get checked out, so I, I went to the hospital. I need to get checked out, because yeah. I was right, as always. Kind of a cute video, right? And Fetterman is speaking directly to the camera, so obviously he's not completely incapacitated from a stroke. But this brought up another set of issues. Fetterman's health emergency occurred on May 13th, and it took another two days before they let the public know about it. But on May 14th, his campaign posted a video on Fetterman's Twitter account showing when he was speaking to supporters in York County. And on May 15th, two days after his stroke, this tweet was posted featuring photos with his supporters saying, pretty easy when you have selfie sticks for arms. And not to be picky, but Fetterman's only holding a phone in one of those pics, but whatever. But the point is that for two whole days, in the middle of early voting and just days before the Pennsylvania primary, the campaign hid the fact that Fetterman had a stroke. And after they made it public, Fetterman downplayed his health status. Fetterman released a statement saying, the good news is I'm feeling much better and the doctors tell me I didn't suffer any cognitive damage. I'm well on my way to a full recovery. So if you were someone who marked their ballot for Fetterman in early voting, hearing from him that he didn't suffer any cognitive damage was good news but it was also incredibly misleading. On October 11th, five months after his health emergency, Fetterman described to NBC News' Dasha Burns why he needed special accommodations during their interview. Walk me through why we need the closed captioning, how it works. Yeah, it's, it's really just how things happen because I sometimes will hear things in a way that's not perfectly clear, so I use captioning. So I'm able to see what you're saying on the, uh, in captioning, and I'm able to respond to, uh, with the, the question. And in this letter, Dr. Clifford Chen stated, occasional words he will miss, which seems like he doesn't hear the word, but it is actually not processed properly. Very poor sentence structure aside, it's apparent that it's not as simple as missing words occasionally. An example of this is when Fetterman was explaining the benefits of the closed captioning system. I, I know what you're being said to make sure that I'm able to give the, the perfect answer. Let me read that back. I know what you're being said to make sure that I'm able to give the perfect answer. But his doctor claims that during Fetterman's examination, he spoke intelligently without cognitive deficits. His speech was normal. Now, I'm no doctor. And I'm not trying to be mean here, but arguably that's not true. I gave away the I gave away the lieutenant governor governor in Pennsylvania, the only lieutenant governor in the history to do that. Send me to Washington, DC. <laughs> take on to make sure I push back against work to work. <laughs> and the Eagles are so much better than the Eagles. No, no. The hard reality is that those mistakes on the stump had nothing to do with auditory processing. Giving remarks is not the same as trying to listen to someone during a conversation. And combined with his auditory processing issues, Mr. Fetterman is clearly impaired. And I'll say, Katie, that just in some of the small talk prior to uh, the interview, before the closed captioning was up and running, it did seem that uh, he had a hard time understanding our, our conversations. To members of the left, Dasha Burns reporting that Fetterman had trouble understanding her and her crew was akin to blasphemy. And Twittyets like journalist Kara Swisher rushed to not only defend Fetterman, but to drag Dasha Burns. Sorry to say, but I talked to John Fetterman for over an hour without stop or any aids, and this is just nonsense. Maybe this reporter is just bad at small talk. But if you actually listened to Kara Swisher's podcast, and why would you, you would have heard the following. 
I, I want to explain to start with what the auditory processing issues. Uh, it's not just a straightforward Zoom or Riverside or everything else. We are using Google Meets and closed captioning. So during that interview, Kara Swisher pointed out that Fetterman was using closed captioning. But she said in her tweet that she interviewed Fetterman without any aids. We are using closed captioning. So much for journalistic integrity, Kara. And one of the most insane tweets I've ever read in my life comes from Emily Timble, a young adult fiction author who accused Dasha Burns of the following. Stop acting like you, a public media figure, have no responsibility to understand the ramifications of framing a disabled political candidate as unfit. You're not reporting what happened. You're being disingenuous and unethical and should apologize. Real shit is at stake. So let me get this straight. Fetterman himself stated that he needs the closed captioning system so that he can understand what people are saying. And without it, he has difficulty. But when Dasha Burns reported that without closed captioning, Fetterman had difficulty understanding her, she was being ableist and trying to sabotage his candidacy. But saying that Dasha Burns reporting has ramifications and that there's real shit at stake is saying the quiet part out loud. They don't care about the truth and they definitely don't care about John Fetterman's health. They only care about one thing, flipping a Senate seat blue. And that brings us to October 25th, the day of John Fetterman's debate with his opponent, Dr. Mehmet Oz. And it didn't start off great. What qualifies you to be a US Senator? You have 60 seconds. Hi, good night, everybody. So as I pointed out earlier, Fetterman has not released his detailed medical records and moderator Dennis Owens asked him about it. Mr. Fetterman, will you pledge tonight to release those records in the interest of transparency? You have 60 seconds. No. Uh, to me, for transparency is about showing up. I'm here today to have a debate. I have, you know, spe speeches in front of 3,000 people in Montgomery County, you know, all across Pennsylvania, big, big crowds. You don't need to see his medical records because he's appeared at moderately sized rallies. Come on, man. And I believe that again, my doctors, the real doctors that I believe in, they all believe that I'm ready to be served. Follow up, I didn't hear you say you would release your full medical records, why not? You have 30 seconds. No, uh, you know, again, my doctor all believes that I'm fit to be serving and that's what I believe is where I'm standing. Oh, you mean the doctors that say your speech is normal? Sure, okay. Next, Dr. Oz accused Fetterman of not paying tens of thousands of dollars in back taxes. He has specifically said you have not paid your taxes and that you want to raise taxes on Americans. How do you respond? Now, this is a very important moment for Fetterman. If Oz is lying about him not paying taxes, he needs to address it clearly and concisely. Of course, he's lying. It was helping two students 17 years ago to help them you know, buy their own homes. They, they didn't pay the bills and it got her paid and it has never been an issue in, in any of the campaign before. It was all about nonprofit. Thanks for clearing that up, John. Now, one of the bigger moments of the debate was on the subject of Medicare and Social Security. We need to make sure that Dr. Oz and the Republicans believe in cutting Medicare and uh, Social Security. What? And I believe that they have to support and expand Social Security, and if somebody sends me to send me to Washington, D.C., I would support and stand and to support security, uh, social security. Yeah. Now, despite the fear mongering from Democrats, the reality is that Republicans want to save and strengthen Medicare and social security. Here's Dr. Oz in the matter. Well, for one, we have to make sure that it adequately increases with the higher inflation rates that we have. So we've got to make that 4% of wasted money that right now is in the budget uh, redirected appropriately. And one of the first places that I would use it is Social Security and Medicare. Social Security, Medicare, which I know a lot about as a doctor, are the fundamental uh, element of security for our seniors, and they deserve to feel like they're valued by our nation. John Fetterman, again, has been running ads and saying that I'm against those with no proof. I have never said anything different than what I'm saying to you on this stage. Now, again, I just can't, I can't just say one thing other than that Dr. Oz would not support and he would support cutting Medicare. 
and that's basically John, a, a why do you it's, say it's, that? It's, I've it's, never it's said a, that. It's absolutely a fact. He's going to make such a great, great senator. Your opponent has criticized Democratic spending, as you heard. Has the Biden administration overspent? And if so, where do you think spending should be cut? You have 60 seconds. No, here's what I think we have to fight about inflation here right now. That's what we need to fight about inflation, you know, right now because it's a tax on working families, you know. And Dr. Oz can't possibly understand what that is like. You know, he has 10 gigantic mansions, you know. Fetterman is so excited for even the broadest opportunity to paint Dr. Oz as an out of touch multimillionaire that he's not answering the question. He, we, we must push back against corporate greed. We must make sure that we're also pushing back against price gouging as well too. Price gouging and corporate greed. The question was about government spending. You know, we also be able to make more in Pennsylvania and make more in America. When he had a choice to make his merchandise, the Oz label is on, he made it all in China. Fetterman is referring to an article from Salon that points out that Dr. Oz Good Life, a line of sleep products, is manufactured overseas. And while items like mattress protectors and weighted blankets are manufactured in China, the mattresses are made in Spain. And to be fair, it's not like Dr. Oz has a say regarding where these items are manufactured because Dr. Oz doesn't own Dr. Oz Good Life. That would be Maven, a consumer goods company who makes the products. And Maven is paying Dr. Oz so they can slap his name on the packaging. It's strictly a licensing deal. You know, who can you believe that can fight against inflation and pushing back against corporate greed or somebody that is chosen working in China versus over American workers. Now look, I've been saying for a while now that Americans need to try and make an effort to purchase products made in the United States. So if you want to criticize someone for being affiliated with products made overseas, that's fair, I guess. However, you know those famous Carhartt hoodies that Fetterman wears as part of his fake working class image? Well, you'll never guess where they're made. So according to Carhartt's website, those hoodies are not made in America. They're imported. So hang on, the man who is talking about corporate greed and making more products in Pennsylvania and America is wearing a hoodie that's imported? No. So with that, I decided to take a trip to my local Carhartt location to see for myself. Here's a rack of the exact style of hoodie that Fetterman wears, and as you can see, it's made in Mexico. And let's not forget Fetterman's Carhartt jacket. Gee, I wonder where that one's made. They didn't have the blue in stock, but it is in fact the same style, which is made in Vietnam. So every time Fetterman makes a public appearance, he's essentially giving free advertising to Carhartt, a company that makes 98% of their clothing in Mexico, Cambodia, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, Jordan, and Vietnam. And I say 98% because a sales associate told me that only 2% of their products were made in America. Which makes sense since there was only one item that I found in the entire store that said it was made in the United States. But even then, it was made of imported parts. You're not allowed to criticize someone for making products overseas when you yourself are willing to buy and wear clothing from a company that imports most of their products. You can't run with the slogan, make more stuff in America, while wearing a hoodie made in Mexico and a jacket made in Vietnam. We can fix our economy. We must make more stuff in America. Yeah, tell that to Carhartt, you hypocrite. So later, the candidates were asked about making higher education cheaper. And Dr. Oz brought up the fact that Fetterman is totally fine with Biden for giving up to $20,000 in federal student loan debt. Here's Fetterman's response. Uh, again, Dr. Oz, you know, loves free, free money when it's a, a half a million dollar tax break on one of his, you know, homes down in a ranch in Florida. And whether it was a $50 tax break, you know, about his farm in Montgomery County. $50 tax break. Got it. $50 tax break. You know, I, I, I fundamentally believe that every quality public university education should be very 
affordable in, in, in every state. And I think that needs to be a, a significant investment, you know, to make sure that anyone be able to afford to go to get a four degree uh, university degree. A four degree university degree, <laughs> sure. And look, there's nothing wrong with wanting people to be able to afford college, but there needs to be a plan. And Fetterman doesn't have one. How exactly, Mr. Fetterman, do you propose doing that to make it more affordable for, a fam for families? No, I, I just believe, I just making it that much more, it, it, it costs too much. And I believe providing the resources to, to reduce the tuition to allow families to be able to afford it. So Fetterman's plan to make education more affordable is to lower costs because he believes in lowering costs. Makes sense to me, what's your problem? Then, in Fetterman's worst moment of the night, he was asked about his shifting stance on fracking of natural gas and oil. Please explain your changing position, 60 seconds. Uh, uh, I've, I've always supported fracking, and I always believe that independence with our energy is, is critical, and we can't be held, you know, uh, you know, ransom to somebody like Russia, you know. But his statement that he's always supported fracking is a provable lie. Fracking, yeah, fracking. No, I, I, I don't support fracking uh, at all, and I never have. I don't uh, support fracking. I, I think it's something that has to eventually go away. So John Fetterman, who, without any proof, accused Dr. Oz of lying about his position on Medicare and Social Security, is now himself caught in an actual, inexcusable lie. You're saying tonight that you support fracking, that you've always supported fracking, but there is that 2018 interview that you said, quote, I don't support fracking at all. So how do you square the two? Oh, uh, I, I, I do support fracking and I don't, I don't, I support fracking and I stand and I do support fracking. It's one thing to say that you've changed your position. It's another to lie and say that you've always supported something when there is video evidence to the contrary. And if there was one moment to derail Fetterman's run for Senate, it was this one. Fracking, yeah, fracking. No, I, I, I don't support fracking and I never have. I've always supported fracking. I don't, I don't. Next, the candidates were asked about their position on abortion. First, Dr. Oz went out of his way to explain that he is for leaving the legal side of it to the states. There should not be involvement from the federal government in how states decide their abortion decisions. As a physician, I've been in the room when there's some difficult t conversations happening. I don't want the federal government involved with that at all. I want women, doctors, local uh, political leaders, letting the democracy that's always allowed our nation to thrive to put the best ideas forward so states can decide for themselves. And the left went nuts, of course, because anything that falls short of allowing a pregnant person to unpregnant themselves until the moment of birth is unacceptable. Here's MSNBC's Joy Reid with the hyperbolic fear-mongering. I want women, doctors, local uh, political leaders, letting the democracy that's always allowed our nation to thrive to put the best ideas forward so states can decide for themselves. Ah, yes, ladies, just you, your doctor, and maybe your town council person can all come to a consensus on your uterus. Just another example of how Republicans are struggling to avoid saying what they really plan to do about abortion. So it doesn't matter what Dr. Oz actually said because pathological liars like Joy Reid are going to attempt to convince whoever will listen that if he's voted into office, he's gonna be like, psych, you got pranked ladies. Apparently this fellow running against John Fetterman even believes that local politicians belong in an examination room while a woman is in that room with her doctor. So Kamala is claiming that Dr. Oz literally wants local politicians in examination rooms with women and doctors. No, not hyperbolic at all. And of course, Joe Biden tried to get in on the action. And as we've all heard and saw on Tuesday night, Dr. Oz thinks the right to choose should be between, as the vice president pointed out, a man, excuse me, a woman. I want to look into the face of every woman in Pennsylvania. 
you know, if you believe that the choice of your reproductive freedom belongs with Dr. Oz, then you have a choice. But if you believe that the choice for abortion belongs between you and your doctor, that's what I fight for. Roe v. Wade, for me, is should be the law. He celebrated when Roe v. Wade went down and my campaign would fight for Roe v. Wade. So articulate. And while Dr. Oz's answer was very clear, unlike anything Fetterman said all night, Lisa Sylvester asked how he would vote on a very specific piece of legislation, the one that was introduced by Senator Lindsey Graham, which would only give women three and a half months to decide to unpregnant themselves. If the vote were held today, you were elected senator, you were on the Senate floor, the clerk calls you, there's a roll call vote. Are you a yay or a nay? I love how she's woman-splaining to him as if he doesn't know how the Senate works. How would you vote on the Lindsey Graham bill? You have 30 seconds. Lisa, I don't even need 30 seconds. I'll give you a bigger answer. I am not gonna support federal, federal rules that block the ability of states to do what they wish to do. The abortion decision should be left up to states, and specifically when John Fetterman wants- You roll wants, with Doug Mastriano. John, when I'm you done, are, I can, one, John, one you'll moment, have your turn, Mr. John. One moment, Mr. Fetterman. <laughs> Continue, Mr. I've Oz. I've been very clear. Yes, he has. And up to this point, the debate moderators were doing a pretty good job with their questioning. Mr. Oz, I want a 15 second clarification. You are saying that you would leave it up to the states that the federal government does not have a role here. So are you saying you would not vote for the Lindsey Graham bill? Any bill that violates what I said, which is the federal government in interfering with the state rule on abortion, I would vote against. I would vote against, which I don't think could be any clearer. But then Lisa Sylvester asked him a fourth time. So a yes or no on the Lindsey Graham bill? I think I've answered it very, very clearly okay. three times, Lisa. Okay, all right, thank you, Mr. Oz. <laughs> Gee, I didn't see Lisa Sylvester push Fetterman that hard after he lied about fracking or his tax issues or not being transparent about his health. Funny how that works. So two things happened after the debate. The first is that everyone on the left lied and misrepresented Dr. Oz's answer on abortion with headlines like, Dr. Oz's awful answer on abortion and what Dr. Oz really said about abortion. What really nails that is the in the room part. Like he starts with you're in the room having the difficult decision and then invokes uh, the people who would be making that decision on abortion, a woman, her doctor, and local political leaders. So that we're all in the room together. You got Dr. Oz, you got a woman who's pregnant, and then you've got, I don't know, what would inevitably be the most extreme right-wing legislature Legislator? Great job, Rachel Maddow. The second thing that happened was, predictably, the left defended Fetterman's debate performance in a big way. Here's New York Magazine's Rebecca Traster. The insanely high stakes of this election, this single debate, clearly this was a candidate who was feeling stress and there was such intense scrutiny, often ableist scrutiny, on how he was going to communicate. And he just did a debate in front of, a, you know, uh, the nation. You mean he did the bare minimum showing up to a debate? Wow, what a hero. His very fluent and direct response on raising the minimum wage I thought was a really strong mo moment for him. Yes, let's watch this fluent and very strong moment. Do you support raising the federal minimum wage to $15 an hour? Why or why not? You have 60 seconds. Yeah, I do. Absolutely. I think it's a disgrace at seven twenty-five an hour. And how can a man, you know, with with, you know, 10 gigantic mansions, you know, has uh, unwilling to talk about a, a willing wage for anybody? Imagine a signal mom trying with two children, trying to raise with them, realizing making thirty one thousand dollars a year, you know, fifteen dollars an hour. You know, I believe every work has dignity and every paycheck must have dignity in it as well. His very fluent, really strong mo moment. So if you watched the debate, or even this video, it's painfully clear who won. But let's see what the experts think. According to the opinion writers at the Philadelphia Inquirer, on a scale of 1 to 10, John Fetterman's average score was 4.3, and Dr. Mehmet Oz garnered a 4.1. So obviously Fetterman won. Duh, I mean, was there ever any doubt? And of course, there's Joe Biden, who has been in politics for like 
150 years. So of course you can trust his assessment. Yeah, I thought he was really good. I thought he knew what he was doing. I thought he was strong. Fetterman is everything that he appears to be. You know where he stands. He has great courage. He has no reluctance to say what he thinks. He's my kind of guy. John Fetterman is Joe Biden's kind of guy. I think that's all you need to know, Pennsylvania. Anyway, that's it for now. A special thanks for Poofy for her help with the script. Follow me on Twitter at Don't Walk Run, and be sure that you're still subscribed to the channel. As always, I hope to see you next time. If there is next time.